So as we promised, uh, we are starting on time today. So this is the third day and uh, we've had a wonderful two days. The first two days were fantastic. It was great participation from everyone. We had almost uh, 400 attendees you know, coming into this webinar. Uh, we also happy that it's not crossed 500 because our limit for this webinar is 500 only. So uh, this is fantastic. And today we are getting more and more coaches in. Very good. For uh, for the ones who are coming back, welcome back. And then the ones who are joining in new, there are a few coaches who I think are joining in new. Uh, this is this webinar is an initiative of the Sports Authority of India. Uh, in uh, you know, in collaboration with the All India Tennis Association, and this uh, whole whole webinar and the course and the contents were put together by the uh, by the team of tutors of the coaches education program of the All India Tennis Association. So, uh, so welcome you all. And uh, today we have a lot of exciting things happening for you, as we did in the last two days. Today also we have. A celebrity coming in, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna allow you to guess. Are there any guesses of who the celebrity is? Without any clues, can you guess? No, it's not Ram Kumar. <laughs> okay, he's a Arjuna Award winner in 2018. Yes. Without even getting a clue, people are able to guess who it is. I don't know how uh, Hajit Singh, I don't know how you guess. Yes, it is Rohan Bopanna. Uh, Himanshu, could you bring Rohan Bopanna? He's there on the uh, attendees list. Rohan Bopanna, can you bring him in, please? Hi, Biswadeep. Hi. <laughs> uh, would, you, would you want to say address the coaches before we start? I, I will just say hello to I mean, I First of all, thank a uh, very, uh, very warm welcome to Rohan. Hi, Rohan. So, so good to see you. And uh, of course, I'll uh, you've, you've already introduced uh, today's session. We've had two absolutely wonderful days of, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, coaching webinar. Uh, I will take this opportunity to also once again thank the Sports Authority of India to Mr. Sandeep Pradhan, the DG uh, Sports uh, DG Sai, uh, Radhika Shriman, the executive ED, ED teams, and of course Lalita Sharma ji, who's been the who's the regional director, Sony Sai, who's been very helpful, and my special word of thanks to Himanshu from uh, from uh, Sai Sonipat, who's been doing an absolutely wonderful job of putting everything together, making sure there are, there are no glitches. So thank you so much, everybody, and welcome to day three of this absolutely amazing uh, coaches webinar, and welcome, Rohan, once again. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ashwiti. Vishwadeep. Thank you. Hi, Rohan. We are very Hi, sir, excited sir. to have you here. Uh, on behalf of all the coaches and AITA and, and uh, Sports Authority of India, I, I extend a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, Vizra. It's uh, lovely being here and it's a great initiative, I think, uh, by you all to have been doing this. Uh, uh, you know, we are all going through these uh, tough times, but uh, nothing like, uh, you know, learning some good uh, information about tennis, coaching, everything. So I think it's a good platform here for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. That is the whole idea why this was initiated. And uh, talking about the lockdown, uh, could you say a few words about the lockdown and, uh, you know, what do you think is going to happen in the, in the near future, your opinion about it, and uh, what you're doing during I, this lockdown? No, uh, I think uh, the main thing for us, uh, you know, to follow exactly what is happening is to stay at home. And while we are at home, uh, it's very important to have a routine like we have a routine every single day whether we're going to office or whether we're going to the tennis court or whatever it may be even if i'm going for my match i do have a routine of how i prepare what time i eat so i think it's very important to do that eat your meals also timely just because we're at home doesn't mean you shift or change everything 
Yeah. Uh, I have a fitness routine exactly every day at five o'clock. So I make sure I'm ready for that. I eat two hours before, uh, you know, even doing that exercise. So I try and maintain that. So that actually helps me to know what exactly every day I have in plan. Uh, even though, uh, you know, we don't know. It's very indefinite about when, uh, you know, the ATP tour is going to start or, uh, you know, the ATP tournaments are going to start. Everybody um, is still uh, under lockdown and uh, till this virus, everything is cleared. Uh, it's good to have, uh, you know, a, a basic routine and that's what I've been really doing. Uh, and uh, luckily here at home, I have a wall to, uh, you know, uh, practice and I've been doing some wall practice and, uh, you know, for some reason, I just cannot uh, beat this opponent. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. Uh, it's very challenging, yeah. And, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, talking about fitness, uh, is there any difference between uh, doing fitness? Because you are also a very good singles player. You were ranked 213 in the world at one point of time. Uh, and then you shifted over to doubles. We'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, can you tell us what's the difference? Do you do anything differently after you switched over to doubles in terms of fitness? I think uh, one of the key things over the years I had learned is how important a fitness trainer is and doing the right kind of fit exercises for tennis, tennis specific training. Yeah. And that I don't think when I started as a junior was even there. Not many trainers really knew about it. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to these kind of trainers. Yeah. Uh, you know, there were no video calls or WhatsApp calls or whatever back then to really talk to anybody. So uh, I think that is where Today, the kids can benefit a lot. Uh, at my uh, tennis academy, the Ron Bopana Tennis Academy in Bangalore, um, I specifically, uh, you know, bought uh, uh, this gentleman called Chelsea Pinto, who, uh, who's there uh, in our academy, especially because he is focuses all on strength work, agility, balance, which is very important for the, you know tennis. And uh, over the years. Traveling with the physio full time has actually enhanced my game to prolong it for this long in my career. I think, uh, yeah. you know, so that those are the things I think we have to focus on. We constantly worry about whether their results or everything tennis, tennis related. But I think it's the movement is the main thing of tennis players. We really need to focus on, uh, you know, in today's generation. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree with that. Um... Talking about Chelston Pinto, incidentally, he's the one who's giving the presentation today. I'm sure you're aware of it. Uh, do you want to say a few words yes, about him? Yes. Uh, can you give him a small intro? Hey, uh, yeah, one second. Chel I mean, uh, Chelston has been working now for the past uh, one and a half, two years in our uh, academy. Uh, he's got like tremendous experience working with sports, with sportsmen with different disciplines. Uh, he's a former football player himself. You know, he's um, he has a great understanding in needs of high performance athletes. He specializes uh, enhancing athlete performance, mm -hmm. and is also certified. Uh, you know, from the Australian uh, SNC Association, and is a certified uh, personal trainer of the Nesta. So I think not only the experience of him, of him being also with tennis players for these two years, uh, he has also learned a lot. And I think the tennis players have benefited tremendously. I mean, one of the guys who made a big change in his game uh, through his fitness was uh, Nikki Kalyanda Punacha, who actually ended up winning the men's nationals, uh, you know, last year uh, in Delhi. He... Uh, I think has made a huge difference in terms of his uh, flexibility, his agility, the way he moves. He had a big game. He still has a big game, but I think he kept getting injured a lot. So this is something uh, Chelsea really focused on. in our academy okay you know and you just went off the air for a few seconds there uh, the so last, I, no, I was just saying but, i mean it's such a valuable person to have yeah. in our academy 
that I think all these kids today can benefit. I mean, I would have loved to have somebody like him when I played as, you know, when I started my singles exactly. career back then. Yes. I mean, yes. you know, so I feel that today, if we can give the opportunity to these guys, you know, in India, we are very talented in our hands, uh, you know, extremely gifted. But the movement is where we really lack. And I think the other key part is never to compare, I feel, our athletes to a Nadal or a Federer. We have to see what our strengths are and work on that. We cannot, we cannot make, uh, tell a kid, okay, you know, this is how Rafa plays, you have to play like him. Unfortunately, we don't have that. Our abilities are different. And I think with those abilities, we need to really build their strength to, yeah. you know, to make a champion out of, uh, from India. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, it, it has nothing to do with race. It's just the innate talents that each individual has and he brings it forward. And then probably the trainer will be able to identify the talents and then even advise, you know, the coach and the trainer together, they could advise the kind of style the player need to adapt to perform at the highest level. Yeah, talking about fitness yeah. uh, specific to tennis, which is completely true. Uh, can, you, can you throw some light on how specific it has to be if somebody is focused on doubles at a certain point of time? Because uh, today I know like four or five of our players have shifted over to specialize in doubles and they're doing quite well and they need to move up more. So uh, we would like to have some information about what do you do specifically for doubles? I mean, uh, there are specific doubles kind of drills. I mean, the, the lot of uh, double specialty movements are forward and backward, not so much lateral because, you know, your, your transition is to towards going towards the net and staying low at the net, doing a lot of squats in terms of, you know, making sure your legs are strong because there's uh, constantly you're playing the uh, I formation or the Aussie formation yeah. and then a lot of vertical jumps as well. I mean, these are these are few things uh, you know we really need to focus on. And today, if you see in the ATP tour also, I think a lot of the players are playing doubles. Not only you know because uh, they, they enhances their game, but also right now with three three players winning all the Grand Slams, rest are you know taking a chance to you know come and at least do well in the doubles. So doubles is getting extremely tough. It's tough to break through as well. I mean, there are a lot of, yes, like you mentioned, a lot of the players from India trying to, you know, make that step, jump into that uh, top 50, top 30, top uh, top 20 level. But having said that, the fitness still is a very, very high level of, uh, just because you're playing doubles and you're saying you're playing on the half court and you have somebody there, it doesn't mean you work less. I think you, you work equally to, you know, as as much as, uh, you know, somebody would play singles uh, also. Totally, absolutely. Uh, maybe the endurance part could be slightly different. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, uh, but still having said that, if you're there at Wimbledon, you don't know how long the match could go on. <laughs> yes. So, you know, it's, it's always good to have a good endurance. You know, there are certain days you end up playing two matches in a day in case it's raining. So, you never know. So, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, uh, when you're young, you can you can do and work a lot of your on your fitness uh, uh, definitely and yeah of course there is uh, when you're getting older you try and maintain your body and see what's best for you and uh, make sure you do the right stretches and the cooling down which is the most important I think today yeah. when I'm playing uh, you know uh, making sure uh, quality uh, amount of time I spend on my training and tennis. Okay, fantastic. Um... You, were, you mentioned about your junior days, and uh, if I remember right, uh, you were training in Pune at some point of time when you were 15, 16, I don't know exactly when. Yeah, and then, uh, correct, that's right. Yeah, and then you moved to uh, Bangalore, to uh, Bhupati's Academy. Yeah. And then I remember you were, you were training a lot with my friend Kartike. Correct, that's point. right. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of singers and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And uh, just before that, is when till then I I didn't even uh, uh, I or I don't have knowledge I might be wrong that you were not performing that great even in the Indian circuit in the juniors or the men and then when you were I think 18 or something like that you came out and you won a men's tournament in Chennai uh, beating a lot of good players uh, so I I want you to throw some light on how you stayed motivated in spite of the fact that you weren't performing that well I don't know if I'm right there. Uh, I just want to connect junior performance to performing in the in the seniors and at the top level. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for that uh, 
when I started off, I actually went for selection in Britannia Amrita Tennis Academy back then. Unfortunately, okay. didn't get selected. <laughs> I went again to, you know, few other academies, didn't get selected. Even in Pune to the Batra Tennis Center, they said, yes, I, when, uh, when I was in Pune, I could, uh, uh, you know, come and play there, but they will not give me a scholarship. I had to pay for everything and, you know, play. Then at that point in time, my dad said, you know, it's a, at least you can get a chance to play with some good players. So he put me there. Uh, there were three coaches back then. One was uh, Nandan Bal, one was uh, Balachandran, who I think uh, spoke yesterday to, to yeah. you all. Uh, yeah. One was Mr. Narendranath, who everybody known as Chubby. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, so I was there uh, a good five years. And, uh, uh, you know, back then as a junior, uh, yeah, my game wasn't great. I was still going like a journeyman, going every week, uh, you know, training, not knowing, uh, you know, where the tennis was headed. Uh, my dad gave me a bicycle and he said, you know, this is what your mode of transport was. And every day I had about 15 kilo kilometers in Pune, just going to fitness, coming back, going to tennis, coming back. So after four years, uh, then I just forced my dad to give me a motorcycle because I had enough of, my, you know, the riding the bicycle. <laughs> Uh, and actually, the tournament, uh, the men's tournament you're talking about in Chennai in Besnagar, actually yes. came when I was 21. Oh, okay. So much, <laughs> much, yeah, much later, past my juniors and everything. Okay, okay. Uh, that is where I, I think I grew um, a lot uh, bigger. So I became a little stronger. Uh, you know, every time I was hitting the ball, it came with more velocity. So that helped in a way. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think uh, just. And uh, by then, I had moved to uh, Bangalore. I was training with Mr. CGK Bhupati. Uh, and then that gave me a lot co of confidence. You know, after winning that uh, you know, uh, uh, title in Besan Nagar, I hadn't beaten players, uh, which I played there before. So suddenly, this one tournament, I ended up beating everyone and beating yeah. Nitin Kirtan in the final yeah, of the yeah. tournament. Mm -hmm. And uh, 2002, I got into the Davis Cup team. So I think juniors is a transition where you look into try and build your game and not really worry about the results. Because at the end of the day, it is the senior tour where you need to Absolutely. start and the professional yeah. show starts from there. So I think it's to, for the coaches, for anybody out there to really focus on their fundamentals and to focus on their strength and movement at that point in time, because that is when you learn the best and the most of it. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, you know, in Pune or before that, if I had somebody to really work on my movement, my singles would have definitely been a lot more higher, I feel. Okay. Uh, you know, because I, I know I had the game style to, you know, match up at the highest level. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I was late by half a step, by one step, you know, so just to get, uh, you know, to work on that tennis specific things is today, which is, I think, very, very important for us. And, uh, yeah, you know. So, yeah. But yeah, that's about that's pretty much uh, you know my juniors to my to senior oh. transition. Right, absolutely, yeah. So I'm going to take a clipping of this what you said. I need to put it up on YouTube and I need to title it well. So a lot of players and parents will benefit by what you said just now. You know the the uh, the amount of importance yeah. that you give for results early on, without paying attention to development through the development years. It's so important and and like you said. Yep. Yeah, you, you would have had to work on your movements at that point of time. If you had to, if you say, if, you, if your aim was to be in the top 50, I'm sure you have the mental toughness, you have the serve, you have the strokes to be there. Uh, like you said, that one yeah, little part. I mean, I, like, I've, I've hit with the numerous suppliers of, uh, you know, the, uh, at a top level. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you're there when you're standing yeah. and hitting, but when I see them move, I know I, it, it was, I cannot do that because I've never been taught that. So, okay. you know, so that is something I think as a young player is what we need to focus on more. Okay. Especially in the formative years. Uh, also, your yes. game style, the way you were playing, uh, it was an explosive style all the way through. Like you never backed out. You were just moving in and just going for your shots. Uh, which is what, you know, helped you to perform at a later age. But the thing is like in the junior years, like that style, I'm sure is not something that would have helped you. Like you had to just, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is what gave you the confidence to stick on to the same style and not, because I'm sure many people would have advised you to be a little bit more, you know, consistent, be more safe with your stroking, but you just kept going. So, yeah, so, I think, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I had uh, a lot of power in my strokes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and back then when I first learned uh, tennis uh, here in Kool, my dad actually taught me, 
uh, the basics of tennis and he just taught me one grip was one shake and a grip you know for all my strokes so i used to hit it very flat so it was tough for me to with a minute somebody said uh, you know uh, try and make some balls i just started pushing the balls i was not being uh, you know hitting through the ball or you know yeah. hitting the ball. so then i think the best way i felt confident was when i swung through the ball and i hit uh, uh, you know more confidently so i kept going at that style yes i was very very erratic uh, as a junior uh, even on my serve i made a lot of double faults i didn't really have a kick serve only when i went to bangalore mr cgk bhupati worked a lot on my kick serve mm -hmm. i remember you know him making me serve at least 200 300 balls every single day there there, there has been a few times where i've framed the ball and it's gone way over the fence not even anywhere close to the court but having worked on it i mean even till today i work on my serve i mean i keep telling the guys do not work only on your weaknesses work on your strengths as well mm -hmm. and today that second serve is one of my biggest strengths yeah, in yeah, my game good. yeah it has helped me tremendously yeah. uh, you know especially today when i'm working playing doubles i can hit every spot on the court it's only come because of the numerous of balls i've hit in practices and I still keep hitting every single day and every day after a practice, I make sure I serve and that is something I uh, want to keep in. And that has really, really helped uh, me in my game for you know, so many years. Fantastic. Uh, talking about uh, working on your serve, hitting that many serves, uh, just serving 200, 300 serves per se is not going to you know, make it better. You need to do it the right way, yes, of course. But can you tell us about your involvement or what do you tell yourself when you're serving those 200, 300 serves? What kind of goals do you set for yourself? And, you know, how much focus do you do on each serve? So, I love to keep targets. Right. Targets and constantly narrow, keep narrowing the target where I'm serving. And then I tell myself, okay, these are 10 balls. How many can I get close to the target or inside the court? And that's where I challenge myself constantly you know, to try and hit those spots. It's not just about hitting the white serve or the T serve or the body serve, constantly moving the targets, mm -hmm. taking a few balls and seeing every single day how many I can hit. Okay. And that, that has actually helped me, you know, develop my serve a lot more. Okay. That involvement from the player wanting to get better, that much better, I mean, even if it's a fraction of a percentage, you know, on each day is so much important. Um, yeah, I mean, I was once, uh, I remember, I mean, sir, my, uh, like I keep saying, today, yes, my serve is my strength. I went uh, to Monte Carlo uh, uh, many, many years ago, thanks to uh, Mr. Bob Brett, who was uh, watching a Davis Cup tie in uh, New Delhi. He was actually coaching Japan back then. Mm -hmm. And he watched me play against Nishikori. And he actually mentioned it that to someone that if uh, I would go there, he would help me in my game. Okay. You know, so I ended, I ended up going there, uh, you know, to his academy and he actually worked a little bit on my serve. He told me to bring my toss back towards my body, just a fraction to help me on my serve. Even though at that point in time, I felt like I was hitting my serve extremely well. <laughs> that small change from somebody, yeah. you know, who can see that is what is making a difference, yeah. you know, for each player. So the idea is, you know, wherever the players are also to understand and for the parents especially if they are willing to put their uh, kids to the uh, with their coaches trust the coaches yeah absolutely. let them coach your kid i mean do not change every one month two months to different yes. centers yeah. because one of the biggest examples i tell them you you don't do that when they go to a school you do not take them every month and put them in different schools yeah so it's very similar. So if you are putting a kid in an academy, trust the coach in that academy and let him at least be there minimum six months before you see if there's a change or give the chance for a coach also to make that difference. And I think that is something which I love to tell all the parents all the time. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take another clipping of this and put it on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It takes time for the coach to connect with the player, understand the player, see their mindset. And no, like you said, you need to understand precisely what the kid needs to work on and tell that thing instead of like throwing information after information or trying to find all the things that the kid is doing wrong. You need to tell them exactly what they need to do to improve, to get better. 
Yeah, and um, also the, I I think I one thing I would love to tell you know a lot of the coaches who are here today and listening is that yes we can take a kid to a certain level and after that level it's there is no problem in if you are you know sending the coach uh, sending the kid to another academy to a better coach you are only helping the kid develop his tennis don't yeah. hold the kid in your academy only just because you know he is developed. There are, you know, over the years, even uh, all of us out there, there's always better coaches at different levels, you know, been at a different level. So look what is better for the kid and try and give him the best opportunity to be yeah. developing as a player. And I think that is where all of coaches, all of us have to come together and really help the sport and help the kids. Yeah, totally agree. And the, the, the credit for the coach who worked with the player initially is never going to go away. He's, you're going to be his first coach. So the goal is for the player to keep going up and you need to help him in whatever way you can. I and, think you always learn something from each and every person. Yeah. And there is a journey, you know, it's, it's again one going back to the same example as the classroom. Yeah, I cannot take the same teacher or to the, till all the way up to my university or my, you know, post-graduation. I cannot take, it's every class I go, there are different teachers at different levels teaching yeah. us various different things. Mm -hmm. So similarly in tennis, it, it, it is the same thing. Right. Totally. Um, you were talking about uh, your junior days and your dad and other things. So I just want to have a, you know, a small thing from you. Till 21, you didn't perform. And your dad was there right through encouraging you all the time. How was it, your relationship with your dad and his role in your in your career, especially during the junior years? Suresh, the most important thing for me there was not only my dad, my mom as well. Both of them were a big, big support. So I think that is what made the difference. They were uh, working as one team. If they said no together, they would say no. I mean, if they said no, they would say it together. If they said yes, they would say it together. So they made sure that their side, you know, they always helped me in wherever I went. And they said, have short goals. I mean, I, I see in a question where it says, what do you advise on break to break mental blocks? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I say that is that to have short term goals, do not straight away look, okay, I'm going to be the national champion. I'm going to be the grand slam champion. It is about, let's start. Let me try and build, become the best player in my academy. Then let me start becoming, you know, slowly in the state. Let me do there. If I if I'm beating somebody seven six next time, let me try and beat him six four or six three. So in terms of your you're building short term goals, and I think that is where it makes a big difference. And parents' support makes absolutely the biggest help for a uh, for a kid. And when you're when the parents are watching matches, do not coach from the stands because the the players who are playing the especially especially the juniors i mean they are fearing the uh, you know parents what they're going to say if they miss a ball if they hit a double fault because the minute they hit a uh, ball to the net the first reaction is looking straight at the father or the mother and if as parents if they have negative signs showing to the kid he's already going to be fearing more and his game is not going to be uh, you know he's going to find it much harder to play a match so instead of that, if parents are constantly encouraging and after the match, if the parents want to talk to them, let them ask open-ended questions where the kid can ask and answer back in a, in a special way. Not just say, why did you serve in a double fault at this point? Or, you know, in terms of say, you know, how did you feel on the court? What was it difficult? What did the opponent do better? What could you, you could have done better? So some open-ended questions where the kid is talking and that and that will really help uh, you know the kid next time he's playing a match Absolutely wrong. a lot of clips are going to go into youtube <laughs> <laughs> no problem <laughs> okay we'll one answer one last question and then we yeah. are running out of time uh, what's the major difference you found between indian tennis and coaching others now uh, we we know that you are a homegrown champion uh, you you are uh, your training everything was done in india and you are a uh, you know world class performer so you are the right person to answer this. So you you got the question? Yeah, I got I got the question, and I think Indian tennis coaching as is at a very very high level. We need to trust the coaches. That is what the main key is. 
you know right now we have access you know worldwide we keep watching but the knowledge we have here in india is very very high and as uh, you know players if we start trusting the coaches and always look to move up the ladder and go to a go to a tennis center and go to to make your game better and that will really help uh, like i said uh, you know earlier that is something which is and the movement is the number one thing we have, we have to develop in india and i don't see it at all a lot of academies i've seen which is it is not enforced as much you know tennis specific training which is very very important and for parents also they look at it and say oh okay uh, let him play more tennis fitness today don't want you know i think the coaches the parents all even though tennis is an individual sport i think all of us have to come together it's still a team sport when the player plays whether his parents his coaches they all are together at the end of the day yeah you know even when federer to uh, wins his grand slam it's not just him it is the entire team which is winning because they all of them are there who work in hours and hours and hours around the kid to build uh, the kid where where he is today or where that person is today and uh, you know that's something we have to learn from and just having more tournaments in india i think will make a change yes. eventually so totally. i think uh, yes. that is something uh, yeah. which will enhance players to constantly develop and uh, you know get better from india yeah absolutely there, there the junior circuit and uh, you know the the uh, domestic circuit is fantastic right now it is built up so much and uh, i think no, it's a good example what we take if we look at cricket it's such a great structure there yeah. from the junior all the way to the senior that's why we have so many it's a similar example if we have it in every sport i think we'll just build more champions because we have the talent we have extremely wonderful kids you know who wanting to learn tennis now i think it's up to all of us to really build a good system and a structure to you know get tennis to the next level yeah so thanks a lot rohan that was like a very honest and very you know uh, forthcoming answers for everything and uh, like i said i'm going to put up a lot of these videos on youtube i have to make clippings first so that people can just take the information that they want thank and, you so much sir yeah, thank you i think if uh, we, we need to do something to promote whatever you spoke today because a lot of when when it comes from us it is not received very well because they feel that we are a wasted interest here you know when it comes from someone like you the information will go directly to them so no, thanks a lot i so i 100% believe we have everything here in india to build champions we yeah. just have to guide them the right way yeah but so thank thanks. you sir thank you so much for having me i mean you know it was wonderful being here and uh, again great initiative uh by you all to you have start this started this i, I know uh, sai sonipat also has been a huge part yes. uh, you know doing this so thank you guys and uh, you know let's really develop tennis and uh, champions from india thanks a lot rohan uh, thank you sir and uh, you're doing your bit and i wish you all the best with your academy and of course with your uh, tennis that's coming up with you we you had you have you partnering shapovalo i don't know if you're going yeah. to continue doing that or you're uh -huh. going to change partners we don't know But, i mean uh, i i uh, there was a uh, one day i'll tell you a funny story i was in stuttgart uh, sorry i'm taking a, a couple of minutes okay. no, no. i was in stuttgart and i was practicing with shapovalov and um, uh, there was uh, alex diminor and uh, uh, there was one more australian player and suddenly i'm sitting there having water and four of us on the court and i'm telling myself these guys are 19 20 years younger than me <laughs> and i'm saying what am i doing here am i doing something should i really be on the court with them but i mean now to watch these guys i mean first hand i've seen the way denis shapovalov moves on court it is something else i keep telling him if i even tried that i would probably break my ankle or break my knee you know doing something like that i mean but uh, you know i think that is that is what he has learned it from such a young age mm -hmm. and that is you know something which is wonderful Thanks a lot uh, for Thank being so here much. with us Rohan it was wonderful talking to you and I'm sure all the coaches would have gained a lot of information through this Thank you sir Many thanks, thanks a lot, for sir. being here Thank you sir bye bye Himanshu can you uh, bring Balachandran and uh, Chelston Pinto onto the panelist please So that was a fantastic interaction with Rohan. I, uh, it's really 
so amazing that all these players are so much willing to come forward and share all the information, all the knowledge that they have for the generations to come up. I don't know if it's uh, <clears throat> some kind of a patriotism or is it something that you develop as a player that you want to give, whatever it is. You know, with Yuki yesterday, with uh, Nandan the first day and Rohan today, it has been a phenomenal interaction. Uh, amazing. So, uh, Ra welcome uh, Balachandran again. You are, you are on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, Chelston. Okay. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Yes. I heard a lot about you uh, through Balu and Rohan, and I uh, can't wait to hear your presentation. So Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I uh, wish you all the very best. And uh, Balu, can you take over from here? Introduce uh, Chelston, and then you know, go on with the proceedings. Sure, sure, Suresh. Thank you, and uh, sure. bye -bye. namaste to all of you. Uh, Morning, uh, Justin. I'll uh, Morning, introduce you to the attendees, and then the floor is all yours from there on. <laughs> uh, 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 Rohan already uh, gave a brief uh, intro of uh, Charleston to all of you. As he said, uh, he was a former uh, professional footballer, he played for Karnataka and uh, many other clubs in India. He still looks a footballer. I mean, you can't. Then we can easily mistake him for a current footballer as well. He's as fit as that. <laughs> yeah, moving on, uh, when he decided to take up, uh, you know, become a strength and conditioning coach, uh, you know, he has uh, decided to do the certifications. And uh, he has uh, certifications from uh, NESTA and uh, Australian uh, Strength and Conditioning Association's uh, ASCA Level 2 uh, certification as well. He's also contributed uh, for the Journal uh, of Australian uh, Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, present, uh, he's a co-founder of uh, Rapid Sport uh, Fitness Gym in Bangalore, which uh, trains high-performance athletes. He works with uh, athletes from you know, multiple uh, sports, including uh, tennis. And uh, he's been uh, working uh, with RBTA for the past uh, couple of years. Personally, I worked with him. so. I know what he contributes and uh, what he brings to tennis. And uh, today he'll be uh, speaking to all of us and giving us an insight into ten I mean fitness for tennis. And like Rohan mentioned earlier, it's, it's a very specific uh, requirement. And uh, Chesson is going to enlighten us uh, with this uh, presentation. Welcome, uh, Chelston. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, thank you, Balu sir, for that introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present here. Um, big thank you to Rohan as well uh, for getting me into the sport first and uh, you know really backing me to do um, what I was brought in to do. Um, let me just share the presentation screen with you all first. All right, I hope it's visible to everybody. Okay. Um, big thank you to Sai and Aita, Aita as well for organizing this uh, for all the coaches. I think it's a great initiative and I'm really happy to be here. Um, as Rowan mentioned, I've only been in the sport for the past two years. So um, it's been a great experience. It's been fulfilling because I think uh, tennis as a sport is physically very, very demanding. And to be honest, even though I've been in the sports circuit since um, I was really, really young, um, tennis is something that, you know, I've not experienced as a player. So initially it did have, um, I did have my challenges, but I think, um, as in when you spend more time on court and I did plenty of that in the, in the past two years, you tend to understand more and, you know, you can really research as to what exactly has been happening. You can, um, there are times that you have to try something different, but at the end of the day, I think, um, you have to always review what the output it, output is, and that's what is really, really important. Right. Um, so today I'll just be speaking about fitness for tennis. All right. So um, I'll take you through the content of my presentation. First of all, uh, we'll just go through what exactly strength and conditioning. All right. The energy systems that we use. 
he was very explosive when he was young so what energy system was he using back then what energy system do you require when you are uh, playing doubles and so on and so forth uh, we'll discuss the long term athlete development plan uh, just an overview of it uh, fitness requirements for tennis which would be um, the major part of our presentation and towards the end i'll also show you as to how i i handle the injury management on a personal level and it could give you some input as well so first to get started um like balu sir mentioned yesterday there's not really going to be interaction here because uh, we're all online but let me just see if one second okay um if okay we can't really use the chat i can't see the chat here all right never mind um my first question was going to be uh, do you think fitness is important for tennis i think uh, more or less today everyone's on the same page that yes fitness is important uh, well to be honest when i first started off 2 uh, years ago um you know i i met a lot of parents and a lot of athletes themselves who didn't really believe in fitness and obviously i'm talking about personal experience here but um, i think uh, once the athlete really gets to know what you're bringing in and you know the adaptation as to uh, the adaptation to a specific exercise or movement um, that's when they really trust you and trust the process so i think that as a strength and conditioning coach is my first job you know to get the athlete and get their parents on board to make them understand what exactly is um you know why exactly we're doing what we're doing obviously um everyone's in there to play and when you join an academy the first thing um you know that comes to your mind is to play um but how can you enhance that tennis tennis performance is through the other work that you do that is fitness your nutrition your mental training and so on all right so that brings me up to the first topic what is strength and conditioning so strength and conditioning on snc is the practical application of sports science evidence based research and philosophy of exercise to enhance movement quality right um i think a lot of you have just heard the interview just now and um you know um rohan kept mentioning movement quality and that's one um that's one quality i think uh, every tennis player needs to work on and uh, in case you want to move or in any case you want to move on to the next level movement quality is really essential for you right so um obviously as i said practical application of sports science is required um evidence based research is required and and you know doing the exercise correctly so the physiology of exercise so those three points are uh, important to note down next we come up to the fitness requirements for tennis all right so um you can use the chat over here to uh, let me know if there's anything else that you think is required for tennis apart from this um i'll start with strength so there's strength there's power there's endurance there's flexibility and mobility i've i've clubbed that into one there's coordination and balance which i've clubbed into one and there's speed and agility so you can use the chat to just think about any other aspect of fitness that you think is important for the sport all right um i think everyone's on board with okay recovery someone said recovery very true so recovery is actually the first thing that we're going to speak about um so moving forward um i want to speak about adaptation first so adaptation the body will adapt to stresses that are appropriately uh, appropriately applied the challenging part is trying to design a training program that overloads the athlete's body without causing overtraining or overuse injuries right so when you use any of these fitness requirements for tennis all right when you're training this fitness requirement the body has to adapt to it all right after the adaptation phase is when the body gets uh, some form of um, um some form of say say if you're working strength um after you after you finish the strength phase all right the body adapts to that strength and once the recovery phase is done then that's when you receive super compensation so um in my next slide i take you through what is super compensation so during and after an intense session there is a breakdown of muscle fibers and depletion of naturally occurring substances in the body leaving the body and nervous system in a state of fatigue right uh from the state of fatigue the body begins to rebuild itself through rest to rebuild the muscle fibers and nervous system back to the original level 
the period from fatigue to baseline level is known as compensation what i just spoke about if an athlete allows for proper recovery from the initial fatigue to the next workout this is when he will achieve super compensation right so this is what we want to achieve in every training session in a periodized plan so if you see the diagram over here training the workload shocks versus recovery um the super compensation effect so figure 1 if you can see the the straight line that is there in the center all right so that is the basic line as to when the the, the athlete is starting his fitness um, or the athlete is starting his training level right so that's the level he's at now if you see the dotted black line um that's where the training happens right when when fatigue happens what happens uh, is performance drops every time fatigue, every time fatigue takes place performance drops which is required right you want to load the body so from the baseline so this is the baseline all right um when when there's performance happening all right when you're training or load there's a downward slope so this downward slope all right once you stop there you allow recovery right so that's by the end of the session say if you have about um 12 hours to your next session so you allow recovery and in this instance the recovery is just above the baseline so if you can see the alphabet a uh, that's the amount of super compensation that has happened to this particular athlete right now if you go uh, take into consideration the red line the red line again he starts the athlete starts from the baseline from the baseline there is training which happens so fatigue happens and the performance drops all right so once that performance drops so once fatigue kicks in you stop the session after you start the session maybe it could be 6 hours after it could be 12 hours after all right it could be 24 hours after so in this case what happens is recovery is all the way up if you see the if you see the line b all right so that's where super compensation is happening right why because there was fatigue through loading and then after loading there was sufficient amount of rest or the recovery methods used was really good and that's why there's super compensation so when the athlete comes into training the next day you know he's improved or if the athlete come, comes into the session the next week he's improved quite a bit because of the loading that happened the previous week now if you see the third instance where you train really 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 hard all right the it's the red dotted line um this instance is where you train really hard throughout the day or throughout the week and the athlete just about manages to reach his base level at the end of the day or at the end of the session or at the end of the week now over here there is no compensation that has happened so what is happening there is maybe you build energy systems okay maybe you build endurance but you've not really built or you're not really um uh, taking your performance up to the next level right and um, this is an important stressor in tennis because uh tennis is a sport that is practiced every day probably five or six times a day, uh, five or six times a week and the load is quite a bit so it's uh, up to us to be able to um you know know where to draw the line and how to actually periodize each plan right so periodization in itself is a topic uh, which is very broad so i won't i won't really go towards periodization too much but just to give you an overview uh, periodization is a plan that you create uh, for a particular season now i know tennis is a um, sport played throughout the year especially in the developing stages there are tournaments that are you know there throughout the year and athletes at the end of the day want to go out there and play because they want to improve their ranking but what is the best way to do it right um as uh, ron mentioned and you know i heard yuki mentioning the same thing yesterday at the developing stage i think what's more important is to think about your future and not really what the present situation is right you you're training you're putting in the hard work you're putting in the, um you know um effort in the movement movement mechanics because you want to do well in the future you don't want to get injured in the future you want to make sure that you're really strong for the future right so um that's where periodization is very important so when you when you take into periodization there are three different cycles there's a macro cycle there's a meso cycle and there's a micro cycle right um a macro cycle is usually a big cycle maybe throughout the season um a micro cycle is ideally a one month plan and a meso cycle is a one week plan right so um your if you just see towards the right side of my screen uh, of of your screen this performance um performance can decrease if training is too hard or recovery and super compensated uh, super compensation have not been planned right so the theory what i just um explained on the left side if that's not planned then this is what will what your sessions will look like so if you see monday or week 1 
all right um this um the diagram starts here and then there's a downward curve throughout right but id how do you want to want it to be you might want a downward curve but at some point of time you want that curve to come up here there's way too much of fatigue so when there's fatigue the regression comes through um you know uh, the body switches off there's lack of motivation uh, players get injured um, there's overuse there's overtraining right so this is something that we need to avoid using a good periodization method okay this brings me to the next topic which is energy systems now energy systems i'll explain it in a very basic manner because i know for sure um, most of you over here uh, know about it uh, but just to give you um, more insight into uh the details of energy systems okay so uh, i got a few questions here and uh, we'll address the questions all together in the end but let me just see if anything is very relevant right now how to increase strength and flexibility how to overcome so how to uh, increase strength and flexibility is a very broad uh, question um if it's specific to something maybe you know i can uh, speak about it but how to increase strength is by loading as i said earlier and to ensure that this is this the the overcompensation or the supercompensation happens right and that's when the strength will increase flexibility at the end of the day is uh, something that i will come to uh, towards the end how to overcome and fasten the recovery i will come to and how do i know whether it is overtraining or is adequate or is it so uh, this would come um, this is a good question how do i know whether kids kid is overtraining or it's adequate or it's light so that is something that you will have to consider uh, you know making sure that you do some athlete monitoring um, obviously having a strength and conditioning or a fitness coach with help in this perspective um, there are many ways to do it one is heart rate gps is something that we've not really uh, started using in tennis but in most other sports we use it um but i think when you do the assessment for the athlete at the start of the at the start of the program you know what would level the athlete is at right and for that particular athlete you try and build up um a program where you say okay in 3 months when we do the next assessment this is where the athlete needs to be and that's how you tend to monitor the load and say okay this is right and this might be too much and this would be too less coming back to the energy systems okay so the body performance requires work and work requires energy it's as simple as that a molecule called atp that's the adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency of the body right so just remember this term called atp there are three main energy system uh, which exists in the muscle cell and these um, energy systems uh, you need to replenish it to actually have the energy right so the three energy systems are phosphagen system it's also called the atp or P atp pc system then you have the glycolytic glycolytic system and then the oxidative system um how many of you have heard of this term called aerobic and anaerobic you can just type it out in the chat just say y for yes n for no all right great a lot of you have heard of why and uh, of aerob aerobic and anaerobic so just to put it in very simple terms okay the first two energy systems that's the phosphagen system and the glycolytic system is an anaerobic system all right the third system that is the oxidative system is an aerobic system now these energy systems are very very important for you to understand when you um when you want to program say a tennis session or a fitness session or a strength session right so um what you can do is um, you know try and understand these terms and then try and connect to them when i go to the fitness requirements of tennis okay so i'll just explain each of these systems first let me just explain um, i think a couple of you said you uh, you know to sure about um, aer aerobic or anaerobic so um, um, i'll just explain what is uh, what, what are the terms uh, what, what are these terms and what do they mean so anaerobic is something where you know your heart rate is high and you're not able to breathe consistently like now what i'm doing i'm i'm breathing and i'm speaking to you so i'm working my aerobic system right so aerobic system is something where the heart rate is at a constant pace where you're not really working any explosive movements anaerobic is more of explosive movements more of on more of sprints you feel sometimes the burning sensation on your on, on your chest you find it hard to breathe so those are the anaerobic systems right just to give you an example if you have to sprint 20 meters or for example if you if when you're playing tennis if you have to move from the baseline to, from baseline to baseline um or from one side of the court to another side of the court when you're sprinting that's the anaerobic uh, system that you're using 
aerobic system is when you're planning to do an endurance session and you run for about 30 minutes 60 minutes on and so on and so forth right so um now just going uh, deep down into each energy system the first one is the phosphagen uh, system um, over here uh, this is where rapid movements are involved so all your plyometric movements all your power movements uh, just you know the quick steps um, say if you're if you're a doubles player um, the front and back moving front and back uh, your acceleration deceleration as a singles player all of that comes into the phosphagen system right so anytime when you're training between one second to about 30 seconds you're using your phosphagen system right and athletes need to build the system by training it con consistently the second system is called the glyco uh, gly uh, glycolytic system so this system is primarily a mix of aerobic system and anaerobic system it's both put into one i can say right so um, in an activity level which say for example now if i'm sprinting all right I, I i tell an athlete to you know just do 10 meter shuttle sprints for three minutes now for three minutes it's impossible for that athlete to sprint at 100 100 uh, percent right we all have to reach that conclusion that no the athlete cannot do it it's in, it's inhuman to uh, expect an athlete to sprint 100 percent for two or three minutes continuously uh, over 10 meter distance right so maybe the first 20 or 30 seconds might be the phosphagen system that he's using the second the second system that he'll use is once the phosphagen system burns out he'll move down to the glycolytic system right now the glycolytic system is strength endurance it could be um power movements but movements which have passed that one minute mark so anything between say 30 seconds to one minute up to two minutes falls under the glycolytic energy system. Now, once you further pass that, you move into the oxidative system. As I mentioned earlier, say when your heart rate is stable, um, you know, when you're able to breathe normally, that's when you move into the oxidative system. So in terms of your nutrients and what you eat as well, most of your carbohydrates is consumed during the first stage. That's your phosphagen system, all right? Um, secondly, glyc uh, glycolytic system also, um, um, consumes your carbohydrates and proteins and oxidative system is where even your fats are, fats are involved. Now, just a question for you, uh, where do you think or in tennis as a sport, which system is used? Uh, maybe you can, you know, a couple of you can just type it out on the chat box. Which system do you use? You can just type one, two, three. One is ATP PC, two is glycolytic system and three is oxidative system. If you think it's one and two, then type one and two, one, two and three, you can, you can just all right, so some of you say ETP, some of you say all oxidative, two and three. Okay, just think about it as to which system is used while you play tennis. One and two, all right, a lot, lot of you have been saying one and two. All actually, okay. All right, great. Okay, that's good. It's got you thinking. Okay, so um, if I have to break this down into a sport, now uh, I'm obviously giving you... Um, input based on uh, the maximum amount of research that's out there. But again, it all, all of this uh, SNC as a course itself, it depends from athlete to athlete. It is not the same for everyone. It's just a uh, you know broad overview that I'm giving you. So ideally for a tennis match, a singles match, um, you use 70% of your phosphagen system. That is one, all right? For your glycolytic system, you use 20%. And your aerobic system, that's your oxidative system, you use 10%. Right, so most of your time that you're playing on court is spent using the first system. That's the ATP PC. So you're trying to be as explosive as possible, right? So the, if you go, if you see um, the better players in the world are the ones who are very explosive, are the ones who recover really quick and can uh, produce those explosive bouts over a number uh, uh, over a number of uh, like number of periods of time, right? Um, see, tennis again is. Uh, very challenging because in other sports you would say it the explosive systems would last about one hour two hours or three hours tennis could go anything between three to six hours right and that's where fitness is so very important and not just fitness um as you know a random routine but as a periodized and programmed routine um again most of these energy systems cannot be worked during competition it has to be worked during the off season and the pre-season so um, I'd like to just give you an input about, uh, you know, periodization again as to how uh, an international or an elite athlete would program himself. 
um, and that's something I think that we need to bring in even for the younger athletes or athletes at, at our academy. At some point of time, we have to find um, you know a duration around around the year, around the calendar, saying that okay, none of the athletes should idly go out to play because this is when we are. When, this is when you're going to work on your energy systems. This is when you're going to work on injury prevention, and this is where your fitness is going to go ahead to the next level for you to play tournaments in the rest of the say six months, seven months, eight months, or nine months. Right. So you have to have off season, um, you know, a minimum four weeks, I would say, an off season uh, time. Again, I know I understand that um, four weeks is a lot of time for tennis, but ideally, if you can, you know, even have two weeks, it's still good. So you have a two week off season plan, which is a generalized fitness plan, right? In a generalized fitness plan, I mean, you're not really doing too much of tennis specific, but you're trying and doing more raw running, more hypertrophy. So you put on strength. Um, you know, making sure that your range of motion improves. So as uh, someone had mentioned earlier, um, you know, how do you improve flexibility? Uh, again, flexibility is very difficult to improve during the season. And flexibility is a process. It's just like strength. How do you improve strength? You, you improve your flexibility. And now, why do you have to improve your flexibility is another question that I will answer, um, you know, in the later slides. So just coming down to the uh, energy system, um, um, a table that we have over here, all right? So if you can see, there's duration of activity and dominance of energy system. So if you take the black line, the black line is your first energy system. That's the phosphagen system, right? So if you see the athlete starts at 100% and within 30 seconds, he's out, all right? Out of energy, out of breath. So that is basically your phosphagen system. Now, better athletes will recover from this bout faster, all right? The athletes that are still developing, might not be able to go 100% for about 30 seconds. They might go 100% for about maybe five seconds, eight seconds, or 10 seconds. And they might take longer to increase or to you know, get back to um, a, a nominal level. But a better athlete, he will start at 100%. He can go all the way up to 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, he'll need a short break just so that he can recoup and start again. And he can go you know, again in the next minute, he can go 100%. Now, if you see the second line, that is the blue line, Okay, that's the second system. That's the oxidative system. So here, the athlete starts at zero. He goes all the way up to 100. All right. And by the end of the second minute, he goes down. Right. So this is where you use both the systems, the first system as well as the third system. And um, the oxidative system is where you start at zero and there's a gradual increase in pace. So that's where, you know, um, you use the aerobic system, which is least used in tennis. Okay, I got another question here. Can I train my 12 year old kid with weights? Okay, that's a common question we get. I'll definitely answer that. Um, there's another uh, question here. What is the difference between power and strength? I'll answer that. All right, so we'll move forward. I hope everyone's good till you. Okay, so this is uh, where I'll answer your questions as to, um, you know, when can an athlete start lifting weights? Um, what is the ideal age, how do you train young athletes, developing athletes, athletes who are competing, and so on. Again, long-term athlete development as a subject is pretty broad, and I'm just going to give you an overview of it. I'm just going to check the chat again now. I'm just getting notifications. Okay, I got another uh, another question. Is functional training useful for tennis? Absolutely. Functional tennis is probably the most uh, used form of fitness for tennis. Okay, so uh, okay, so here's a long-term athlete development. I'm sure most of uh, most of the coaches here have gone through it, and some of you have even uh, mastered it in a way. Uh, I'm just here to not really talk about the technical aspect of it or the tactical aspect of it. It's more towards fitness and you know how the body is developing from a young age and how you can take it up to the next level. Um, a lot of inputs given by Rowan in his interview uh, had said that you know uh, movement efficiency is the key when you're growing up. Uh, Yuki yesterday mentioned that um, he would have done a lot better in um, in terms of injury management if he had got personal assistance at the at, at a stage you know where he needed it so i'll take you through all those stages and um, you'll get a fair idea so if you start right at the bottom okay that's the physical literacy uh, stage 
or the fundamental movement skill. Okay, so uh, your active start, you don't really have to worry about the active start because that is more to do to, uh, to do towards the parents to make sure the kids are active, making sure that you know uh, technology is not um, uh, making um, not taking the advantage of. Uh, these days, you see a lot of kids even uh, below the age of two, uh, which highly should be unacceptable. That you know they are using technology um, to distract them or you know to pass their time. Uh, again, it's uh, it's the parents' call over here, but um, ideally, you don't want to use uh, technology at such a young age, right? At least till a minimum age of two. I know some kids don't watch TV till about three or four, but I would say a minimum age age of two. Um, fundamental. So uh, when we come to the next stage, fundamental. So this is ideally the age between six to ten. Okay. Uh, again, I'm just giving you a broad um, broad aspect of this, uh, broad learning of this. So fundamental stage is when you try and develop the motor skills of the athlete, right? Um, you're, you're not really teaching them tennis, you're teaching them to have fun, um, teaching them teamwork, teaching them discipline, uh, coordination, making sure that they, you know, they have balance, the stability in what they're doing, and at the end of the day, it's fun. So everything has to be fun in this stage uh, between the age of six to 10. Uh, during this stage, I feel um, the other thing um, that is necessary is not give too many instructions. It's more of follow the leader. You know, you show them what to do, or you appoint a leader, and let let it just flow, right? Um, in terms of coaching, all we have to make sure is that they're not getting injured. There's no overuse of a particular muscle because you know uh, you see a lot of kids who come with uh, with um, you know um, abnormal postures, I would say, or imbalances. Say one of the most um, specific ones is shoulders coming inwards. All right. So these are things that we'll try and fix at this stage. But again, we're trying and keeping it as much. Uh, fun as possible rather than make it anything to do with technical or tactical stuff. Um, at this stage, between 6 to 10, the girls and the boys will be at a, um, on par in terms of physical capabilities. In fact, I would say in most cases, the girls would have more balance and stability in what they're doing as compared to the boys. Right? So the boys mature a little um, uh, later uh, as compared to the girls. So between six to ten, this is where girls, most case in most cases, have advantages, right? Uh, when we move on to the next stage, so the, the fundamentals and learning to uh, uh, fundamentals is six to ten. I would say learning to train is between ten to fourteen. So uh, between this age is when um, you teach them a little bit more about tennis. Okay, um, you can get into a little more tactical work, um, not really tactical work, but technical work. And uh, in terms of fitness as well, uh, this is when I would say the first assessment is required between the age of 10 to 14. Now, when we do assessments, I'll come, I'll come back to what assessments we do. Um, but when we do assessments, we ideally want to do assessments periodically. You don't want to do um, assessments too, uh, too many times throughout the year because that bores the athlete and it doesn't give the strength and conditioning coach or the fitness coach or the tennis coach enough time to work uh, on the athlete. But um, you want to do it at least once in three to four months. So maybe three times a year is, is, is a good number to have, right? So during this learning to train phase, this is when they will um, learn the correct mechanics of running because in fundamentals, you're teaching them to land, you're teaching them stability, balance, coordination in the form of games. You're, you're teaching them in terms of mechanics. They need to know the right form of running. They need to know how to squat, how to sit, how to stand up, right? How to cross over, how to shuffle, um, different movements that uh, the game um, you know the game or you know any spe any any um, specific sport would require the next stage would be train to train stage uh, so this stage is i think the most crucial stage of an athlete and has to be handled with a lot of care uh, with a lot of um, research again and with a lot of um, uh, reviewing of what you're actually doing what you're actually programming what the outcome is of each session or what's the outcome what what the actual outcome is of every week of training right so during this stage um just to give you a difference between the boys and girls um what happens is the the boys would develop muscle during the stage so um you know they'll grow faster the height they increase in terms of the height as well um so you know there is more power but now how do we curb this power Okay, so this is the stage where there are maximum number of injuries in growing athletes. And for a woman or for a girl, this is the stage where they leave sport because there's too much of stress, there's too much of injuries that are caused due to uh, overloading or wrong mechanics that are taught. 
Okay, so uh, for the boys, um, we need to uh, first curb that power. So when I'm doing that assessment, which is very, very crucial, I will know as to, okay, now this guy has grown, his muscles are growing, his foot size is growing. I need to make sure that, okay, everything is aligned. There's no imbalances in his shoulder because these imbalances that happen at, at this age, that is the training to train stage, is what carries over, uh, carry, carry, you know, keeps carrying forward and will lead to a big injury uh, at a later stage. Sometimes it might not happen right away, but in the future, there are more chances of it happening and it's very difficult to correct in the future once the athlete has already grown or once he's already um, into a periodized plan or he's already, you know, his body is adapted to strength training or his body is adapted to something, right? Um, so this is also the stage where, you know, I'm sure tennis technique has changed because the learning to train stage is when they're still kids. Training, training to train is, you know, a little higher and training to compete is even higher. So this is when techniques change because of height differences. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, the limb lengths are different and, um, you know, players tend to feel uncomfortable because of that growth spurt, right? And this is where the coaches need to really take action and say, okay, uh, you know, for this athlete, this needs to be done. And for this athlete, this needs to be done. So uh, as an academy as well, if you're training as part of the academy, I think all eyes need to be at players at this level because this is the crucial stage. Now, um, from for a girl's point of view, uh, this is the stage, um, just say, uh, when they're reaching or before menstruation, that um, they develop more fat percentage, right? Up to this stage, the fat percentage of the boys and girls are normally the same. So the training can be same. Energy systems used and trained can be the same, right? Uh, when you're training energy systems from fundamentals, you try and keep them in the aerobic range as much as possible because if you take them up to the phosphagen range, they won't last there. Moreover, it's risky, right? So until you come up to the tra um, training to train stage, um, don't really do too much of power. Don't really do too much. First, teach them the fundamentals. How do you land? How do you jump? How do you skip? How do you uh, move from side to side? Right? Those are more important than actually teaching them power or tennis specific drills, right? In terms of fitness. So uh, for the girl, um, uh, for the for a girl female athlete, um, there is fat percentage that increases during the training to train or training to compete stage. So this was anything between um, I, I would say 12 to 14, 12 to 18 years, right? So we have, or 14 to 18 years. So during the stage. Um, we cannot give them the same amount of load that, you know, the boy at that age is taking. So be skeptical about that. Make sure that the, your plans are, um, you know, periodized accordingly because the fat percentage incre increases, you know, usually the, uh, the hip um, increases the, you know, what happens when the hip increases is uh, ideally the glutes need to get, need to get stronger. If the fat percentage increases, then there's more load on your ligaments. So say, for example, knees, ACL injuries during this uh, period are very, very common, especially amongst women. Now it's happening amongst women because that fat percentage has increased in them and the body or the ligament. So that's so specifically the knee cannot take that load, the excess fat percentage, right? And there's nothing that the women can actually do about it. They still have to maintain a balanced diet. They still need to train, but train, more systematically right just running and improving those energy systems will not make will not really make a difference in this case what will really make the difference is your strength training right how how strong can you get your lower body right to control or to um, to ensure that the load that you've put on or the weight that you put on is managed well by the lower body right so um, strength training is really important mobility training is really important flexibility training is really important stability training is really important Right. So during this stage, we have to refocus on all that we focus on the fundamental stage. Why? Because the kids have grown, their bodies have changed and they still need to adapt to uh, what their bodies have become at this at this particular time. Right. So, um, again, training all the aspects that are important for fitness, that is your strength, your speed and agility, your mobility, your stability, your balance and coordination. All that has to be focused on in a more systematic way, in a more uh, tennis specific way in the training to train and training to compete stage. And then you proceed to the training to win again from the training to compete stage to the training to win stage. So training to win stage is ideally above 20. There are not too many athletes who survive till then. Why? Because athletes or their parents want uh, immediate success, right? So I get a lot of, um, I'm sure all of us get a lot of, uh, um, you know, um, 
inquiries saying that okay i'm going to put my son or daughter or put this um, put the girl and guy or, or the boy into the academy and i want them to win in probably 6 months in 12 months but i think it's up to us to really uh, make the athlete understand as well as the parents understand that it's a process right in the process if you're winning that is great but what the end goal needs to be is to perform at the senior level right that's where uh, you know that's where it really matters that's where all the work that you've put on from that active stage or fundamental stage is really going to pay dividend right because as you grow older there's not too much you can really improve on in terms of um, you know specific aspects so in terms of movement efficiency all this has to be worked between that learning to train stage to learning to compete stage because when you're training to win that's when the tactical work comes in that's when your tennis coach plays plays a huge role right the fitness coach the physiotherapist all that is support system to just back you to be able to perform well on on the on the court and to make sure that you're performing at a high high level right so uh, this is just a broad overview overview of the long term athlete development one common question that you know i keep getting um, or most of us will keep getting is um, is strength training okay for my kid who is 8 years yes it's okay it's okay for anyone above 6 years so you know the fundamental stage 6 to 10 years you can do strength training but ensure that strength training needs to be done correctly it's not a game right speed and agility can be a game uh you can you can in terms of just movement you can make them play games but strength training is not a game right so if the athlete can connect to me if he can take advice then yes strength train strength training is applicable for him if he cannot then no it's not right so um i think the maturity of the athlete also is important right uh, and this is where uh, again i think the communication plays an important role something that babu so had covered yes um coming into the uh, second the second stage um strength training for between 10 to 14 yes that's why you start your body weight training if your motor skills are really good at the fundamental stage itself then learning to train you can introduce resistance now what is resistance using uh, mini resistant bands for your lower body using bands for your upper body um you know just ensuring that there's stability in what you're doing um ensuring that you're activating your core so these are things that you can learn um when you're uh, learning to train now for some when are you ready to lift weights is another question and there's no specific age for that right it could be at the age of 10 it could be at the age of 12 it could be at the age of 18 right um with regard to ages um there are there are three there are three, three uh, training ages i can say okay uh, one is um, your biological age so um, your age when um, you know you the, the the number of years you've been playing the sport the chrono, uh, chronological age um, that is um, the age that uh, you have been training and then one is your actual age which is that is that is your biological age i'm sorry i got it wrong uh, your biological age is the age that you are okay um, there's there's a training age in terms of your musculoskeletal system right i might be 15 but maybe uh, my body is producing force like i'm someone or my muscles are uh, built as i'm 18 or 19 right so um, the other the other um, training age is when um, the number of years you've been playing so someone who comes to you at the age of 14 and who doesn't have the mechanics he needs to start from the fundamental stage or turn uh, or or learning to train stage even though he is at the training to train age he has to start below because you have to learn the fundamentals of how to land okay how to move your movement efficiency needs to improve and only then you can learn or you can do tennis specific fitness right so um that's how you scale up towards uh, becoming a high performance athlete again you can connect you can connect uh, whatever i just said with regard to ltat when we come back to the tennis requirements of uh, fitness so uh, here's a short video of landing mechanics All right so um this again before someone learns to jump up he needs to first understand how to control his weight right so i'm just going to play this again it's a single leg landing obviously first you start with double leg then you go with single leg then you jump front you jump sideways you jump in different directions so uh before you get to strength training all these mechanics need to be really good you need to be able to run well your posture needs to be good like maintain a straight back uh, neutral neutral spine i would say um ensuring that your body mechanics are are fit or are okay to start training like your body weight training is good you can do push ups you can do at least one pull up right so once you can do all of that then it's the right age for you to start strength training 
I'm just checking a few questions if anything is appropriate for right now. Okay, I think we'll continue. So, um, coming to fitness requirements of tennis, uh, for tennis, the first thing is strength training, okay? So um, this is, I think, um, the most important, the broadest factor that is used as part of fitness. Um, what is strength training? So, or, um, you know, why exactly would you require uh, strength training? Um, the tennis player who can apply their strength most effectively are the ones who can hit the ball hardest and serve fastest. This is why power is where the strength is important. Right? And you need obviously joint stabilization in your rotator cuff, that's your shoulders, your important ligaments that are your, uh, your, hip, um, um, your hip complex and then as well as your ankle um, around the ankle area. So um, just before I, before I uh, give you more details on strength training, I'd like to go back to the energy systems all right, and give you three types uh, when you're playing tennis. What are the three types of, um, like, when are you using these energy systems? Just so that you get a better idea and then you can apply it for all of these uh, requirements. So type one is emphasis on aerobic endurance. So what is an aerobic endurance? It is um, um, the, uh, it is when the heart rate is at, um, is maintained, you can say, right? You're breathing normally, you can speak when you're training, right? So that is uh, that gives you an indication of aerobic endurance. So uh, when you put two players on either side of the court and they're just playing, um, they're just hitting. So say for example, um, cross court rallies with a change in direction after each second or third stroke, that is when they're when they're emphasizing on their aerobic endurance. So that's usually your warm up, right? Um, when the emphasis is on aerobic and anaerobic endurance, so that's when a baseline returns with service. So you're, you're doing the same thing that you did earlier, but this time it's with surface, the service and the players um, must have a rally of three points uh, of three shots before the point is live. That ensures high density of work. So that's when, um, you know, the point, um, the energy system is you're using the aerobic as well as the anaerobic system. And when you're using only the anaerobic system in terms of training is when um, there's a coach centered drill. So say for example, uh, the coach feeds uh, the ball to the, uh, to the athlete and he hits about say 10 or 15 balls moving side to side, moving front and back and moving at a rapid pace, right? So that is when you're using the anaerobic system. And post that, ideally the tennis player would require about 20 or 30 seconds to recover before he can get back to 100%. Now again, in terms of these kind of training, in terms of load, you recover fastest for a developed athlete or for an elite athlete uh, or a training to compete uh, athlete. Um, you develop fast, uh, you recover fastest from an anaerobic situation, all right? The first training cycle, that is the ADP PC, right? That's when you uh, recover faster. Yes, you, your heart rate is pumping, um, you know, um, the movements in terms of strength might be a lot more rapid, but um, your fast twitch muscles are working much faster, um, but you recover faster, right? In between, that's the second cycle where you're using both the aer anaerobic and aerobic cycle. That's when um, you require more time to recover. So maybe after a session, you require at least six hours to recover. Um, the aerobic system where, you know, the session is really long, but one intensity is maintained, right? During that session, that's when you take the longest to recover. Yeah. So coming back to strength training, um, there's two types of exercises in strength training. One is isotonic exercises and one is isometric exercises. So isotonic exercises are when, I'll just give you an example, very simple ex example. So um, say I'm doing a movement, a bicep curl. Everyone knows a bicep curl. I hope you can see my arm. So um, this is me keeping my arm straight, right? Now what I do is I'm flexing my arm. So what is happening to my bicep, right? My bicep, this muscle is shortening, right? So now I extend. Now it's long. Now this muscle is shortening. When the muscle shortens, all right, when there's shortening of the muscle, um, that's when it's the concentric phase. So I, I, under isotonic, you have concentric and eccentric. Concentric is when the muscle shortens. So ideally, uh, what do you think you require in tennis? Do you require concentric? Do you require eccentric or do you require both? You can just type one, two or three on the chat. Like what do you think is required in tennis? Eccentric is just the opposite of concentric. So this is eccentric, this is concentric. All right, both. So uh, most of you have said both, which is true, right? So uh, just to take this, uh, um, uh, to give you an example, what do you require in bodybuilding? 
bodybuilding you require big muscles so you want more contraction happening right you want more contraction happening you don't really care too much of the eccentric motion but why do you care about the eccentric motion in sport for an athlete is because if you're only focusing on the contraction then the athlete at the end of the day is going to walk like this instead of walking like this he'll walk like this right so that is not going to transform into him um it, it's not going to transform into him doing better at its sport at his sport the whole point about fitness and strength and conditioning is do things that is going to help you in your sport right even the generalized fitness that is in your off season you're doing it to improve your sport right so any time you do strength training any time you do speed and agility you work on the energy system development it needs to help in your particular sport right in this case tennis so you have to work both the concentric motion as well as the eccentric motion right uh, just to give you an insight of uh, something else is when you work the concentric motion all right what is happening is, is this is one muscle what's the opposite muscle the tricep right so now if i extend the arm all right so if you if you can just keep the arm down and extend it okay extend it completely lock the elbow what you'll notice is there your tricep is contracted right so when my, my when my bicep is uh, contracted my tricep is there's an eccentric range of motion it's long right but when my bicep is extended all right when my arm is extended all right this is eccentrically loaded and the tricep is concentrically loaded right so uh, this is very important in terms of um, injury management as well because most of the times when say for example you are injured um, on say your quadricep okay um, it could be because your hamstrings are really weak right now concentric motions are used excessively when you are playing itself right so say for example in a doubles in a doubles kind of a situation you're squatting really low you have to be low that's what the game demands right if you're playing at the net you need to be low so that's when your muscles are contracted but what's happening is um, in a say for example in a singles game uh, again maybe you're playing um, a lot of rallies from the baseline you're in a quarter squat position most of the time right but what the game actually requires you to do is also run from side to side most of the points are won or lost because uh, players don't get to the ball on time right so when you're decelerating right that's when the eccentric phase of strength is used right so accelerating is when you're going forward decelerating is when you're stopping so when you're stopping that's when the eccentric uh, uh, eccentric um, loading comes into play right uh, isometric exercises are just holds so your wall sit for example is an isometric exercise there's no movement it just hold so in, in the, uh, giving you the same example uh, when i'm doing a bicep curl if i'm going to keep it at your know, 50% that's when there's mass, maximum muscle tension so that's an isometric hold if i want concentric muscle tension then i'll hold it here and if i want eccentric muscle tension i'll hold it all the way down so that's an example of the strength training methods that are used there are there are lots and lots of um, more complex methods that are used um, for elite level athletes but this is something that you know everyone should know and keep in mind um i'll just play a video for you of so if you can see this video it's a strength endurance session so i'm making the athlete do about um close to about 15 uh, 15 seconds of uh, you know uh, strength endurance so he's just doing lunging with resistance at the back this is a maximal strength uh, session okay so here you can see the athlete um she's lifting 1.5 times her body weight so the athlete is 45 kg she's she's 16 years of age um how do i know she's ready to lift weight because her mechanics are on point right so she's an athlete that i've been uh, training with since uh, she was the age, since she came in at the age of 11 um so it's been 5 years now and she's been strength training for the past 3 years now um why am i giving her you know a lot of questions would be asked as to why is she lifting 1.5 times her body weight she's so young uh you know um, you know isn't there going to be any re uh, repercussions to that uh, i'll give you a simple example okay now um say for example you're jumping all right now if an athlete jumps um say i'm 50 kgs and i'm jumping up i'm landing on one leg now my 50 kgs and because of the impact of the jump becomes 75 to 100 kgs will my body be able to take 75 to 100 kgs if i don't do strength training more often than not no it won't be able to take it why because there's not enough of um uh, eccentric uh, strength in my hamstring right if there's not enough uh, if my if my lower body doesn't have enough strength to take that load of the impact that's when the knees will collapse 
um, that's when the ankle will collapse and that's when it will lead to injuries. So if you're preparing the athlete to play at a high level, yes, you will need strength training. But again, progressive strength training. She's not lifted one and a half times her body weight uh, over one month. She's done it over three years, right? So that's the important um, um, takeaway from this. Next, power and plyometrics. So the difference between strength and power, strength is you're trying to increase your strength. You cannot do power without strength, right? What is power? So um, um, just to give you an example, power is the quality that is associated with speed of movement. Uh, in tennis, the emphasis is on the first step and quick change of direction. So for you to move fast towards the ball or move laterally or move front and back, you need the first step really quick and that is power, right? These relate to the ability of the player to overcome their own body weight and then to initiate movement, right? Uh, the faster athletes do these things, the more impressive they are on court. So uh, power training is, again, an advanced training method. You can start with body weight power training at an early age. That is, you know, just learning how to jump, how to skip, how to bound, um, how to sprint and how to stride, right? But in terms of plyometrics, you need to give it time and ensure that the athlete is 100% ready to take that load and um, to ensure that the landing mechanics are good, the concentric power is good because if the athlete can't jump, the jumping phase is a concentric phase. If the athlete can't jump, don't make the athlete jump. Improve the concentric phase of the strength and then make the athlete jump. All right. Now the athlete, when uh, he or she is landing, a lot of developing athletes will say, hey, I have knee pain. I can't do this. Why they have knee pain is the eccentric power or um, the, the muscles around the knee is not developed yet. So don't make them do those jumps. Make them do a little more strength training and resistance training before they can move to plyometrics. All right. So uh, in terms of energy systems, okay. So the energy system most likely to be involved in tennis training using plyometrics will be the ATP PC system. The first one, anaerobic, the first system, energy system. The system requires exercise effort to be maximum and last from one to 15 seconds, ideally for a tennis specific workout, right? Um, the rest ratio after that would be one is to five. Say, for example, if it lasts for say 10 seconds, um, your, say your explosive movements, then uh, what you'll do is your rest period would be 50 to 60 seconds. Yeah, that's for optimal recovery. Now, with regard to plyometrics um, or with regard to strength, you try and mix it up with what I, what I normally do for my um, athletes to make sure that, you know, they're engaged during the session to make sure that they're doing um, like, you know, they're on point, they're uh, alert. And um, it's also a thing about motivation, doing the same thing every day. Um, is a bit disheartening or, you know, not, not motivating enough. Again, it depends on the athlete. There are some athletes who will put in the grind for you or who understand the process. And there are some athletes who want to be challenged with something new, right? So I stick to the same movements. If it's speed and agility, if it's uh, periodized over, over two or three weeks, I stick to that, but I add a new stimulus to it, right? So I'll just show you a video. This is uh, Nikki Punapa. This is during his rehab stage after he won the nationals. So you're making him do plyometrics with the isometric hold right so what what's happening here is i'm making the feet move fast but the hip st uh, stability is important your torso rotation after that um you know you know a athlete who's not really trained will fall over will not be able to hold this for three seconds right so this is something that um you know i normally would mix when it comes to um you know just doing one form of training so i, I would mix sometimes i would mix strength with speed and agility sometimes plyometrics with something else so you know it's it's just keeps engaging the players as and you know at the end of the day the feedback is such that okay uh, i'm alert i want to give my 100 percent for this session moving on to speed and agility a tennis player must be able to respond to different sorts of signals more quick uh, more uh, move quickly with constant uh, changes in direction in order to become a successful athlete I think everyone agrees with that movement efficiency is the most important thing for tennis. Now, movement efficiency will not only come by training speed and agility, right? You have to ensure that the balance is good. Coordination is good. You have strength, you have power. That's when everything will fall into place for speed and agility, right? I don't want to uh, touch upon too much on speed and, of speed and agility because I know everyone's doing it, but here are just some, um, some videos of, you know, what, uh, what I normally do in a session. So again, this is, um, training to train or training to compete stage. Um, the athletes, what I do, uh, what I did in this particular scenario is they're doing speed and agility in terms of their movement. If you can see everyone's in a quarter squat, that's where they spend maximum amount of time when they're playing. Um, the first sudden step, all right, is when I say go, all right? So um, they, they, they might have to move right or left, all right? They're competing with each other, which gets the best out of them. 
and at the end of the day i want them to train 70% of their time in that energy system number 1 that's what they're doing again it's a very advanced movement so i wouldn't uh, suggest doing it at the very beginning because as you can see here um the movements are very sudden so when i say go the sprinting accelerating the bending down to reach that cone and then decelerating again these athletes have been trained over a period of time so that's why this is doable um there has to be progress before you know you move into this competitive stage uh here's another example okay so this is something called as reactive strength okay so um this is where i make them do quick movements again you're training the first energy system followed by so what happens is when they're doing these five movements the five uh, repetitions of a deadlift but i'm making them do it with power again the form has to be really really good and then drop the dumbbells and move into your shuffles right so here i'm seeing the movement efficiency after the energy system or after their own system is already taxed doing those five movements with power now here's one thing i'd like you to see uh, and notice um if you can tell me which athlete over here is a trained athlete and which athlete over here is a natural athlete just by your instinct all right so if you can say um maybe you can type the uh, type it in the chat um uh, you can say white or red so just put white or red uh, who is a trained athlete over here all right so just watch this again just type out white or red who do you think is a trained athlete in terms of the strength and movement okay let's see what you say some of you said red some of you said white white red white is white is natural red white white red okay okay so um i think it's a mixed opinion so here's um what um so if you see the 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 first uh, the athlete on, in the white okay so just to give you an history he is a bit older he is about 23 or 24 the athlete in the red he is a lot younger he is 16 years of age now the athlete in the red when i did his assessment i figured out that he is a natural athlete okay he can move really swiftly on court he can move he can cover distance he can uh, when you give him that stimulus when you give him a signal he will just move right so he doesn't need to be trained now athletes like this idly my he's already quick he's naturally really fast so uh, i'll play the video again just see his movement in terms of the efficiency how he's decelerating at every cone and how his hip movements is uh, he's dropping the shoulder and side stepping it's just quality that's something that is very hard to train but as well as the white the athlete in the white um his developing stage wasn't the strongest his mechanics are not the best right but at this stage i can't take him back to fundamentals right i have to make do with what i have at the age of 23 24 and try and improvise so him i might have to teach him give him a few tips and tell him this is what needs to be done that is what needs to be done the athlete in the red on the other hand is still young all right so he has the energy he has the speed i don't do anything apart from ensure that he doesn't get injured so why am i making him do the deadlift why am i making him do strength is only so that he doesn't get injured but in terms of tips in terms of training him in terms of speed and agility there's no tips it's all natural he continues doing what he's good at right um just watch his uh, speed and agility movement here see the side stepping there so i would say at the end of the day he is very very efficient in this particular movement all right so i'm just um, i'm running out of time i'm sorry um, everyone in the panel uh, i'm going to finish this in the next say 10 minutes uh, less than 10 minutes uh, i've clubbed all this together uh, flexibility mobility stability balance coordination all this is are equally important now how do you use this in a training system is something that i will show you as to how i do it um why is flexibility important because you need range of motion as an athlete it's as simple as that if you're stiff your body takes longer to recover yeah uh, in terms of mobility um i'm going to show you a video uh, in terms of stability as i mentioned right from your developing age it's very important stability and balance go hand in hand coordination as well um as i mentioned in the previous slide the athlete in the white his coordination stability bal and balance were not the best like his mechanics were not taught to him uh, was not corrected at an early age so once he is already past the age of 20 he is in his training to win stage it's not i can't really bring him back now and say okay i can train him train him to compete but i cannot go back to fundamentals and train to train right so um, at this stage i have to make do with what i get and ensure that okay uh, in terms of stability balance and coordination i help him out 
with um, stim uh, with new stimulus every day so that at the end of the day it becomes muscle memory but if muscle memory is built at a younger age that's the best stage that's the best time to do it ideally even rohan just mentioned that if you want to get faster movement efficiency needs to get better do it at a young stage once you develop um, once you finish the age of 20 21 22 you can work on strength you can work on power um, you can work on react uh, reaction to a certain extent but movement efficiency is going to be difficult like real real difficult right uh, here is a video of stability so that's proprioception for the shoulder the two athletes there just working on their shoulder mobility all right moving on to recovery so what are the forms of recovery um as per research to be honest there's no one way of recovery which will help an athlete all right so that's something that i want to be clear about but um recovery i would say um coming from an athlete's point of view is more psychological than anything else yes sleep is the most important factor of recovery but apart from that there are many other factors there's foam rolling there's myofascial release there's ice baths um there's contrast baths there's deep tissue massages uh swimming uh you know chirotherapy cupping lots of methods to do it um but i know for me um from personal standpoint i like deep tissue massages and i like ice baths i like to get into the ice baths soon after an intense training session so to say about 3 days a week um because psychologically when i'm in there for say about 2 minutes um i'm numb all right it's more for torture mentally i'm switching off from everything else and just thinking as to okay how do i get away from this how do i recover now when i come out i definitely i just feel lighter because maybe psychologically i'm thinking that okay um you know i put my body into this now i feel better right so different athletes feel different things but i think from from an academy protocol um it's good to have uh, fixed things and to ensure that every athlete is doing it obviously once you turn pro um you know and once the athlete has his own support system then um you know you go as for what the athlete wants and what the athlete uh, reacts to better Uh, I'm just going to play this video of foam rolling. I think this foam rolling is essential for everybody. Uh, it's a one-minute video. You can just watch that. I think everyone's been sitting for about 90 minutes now, so you can even stand up, move around. 30 seconds and we will be will be back again this is very basic form of foam rolling uh, there are more intense ways of doing it as well I have one last slide after this. Sorry. Alright, so this is lower body release. There's also upper body release, which are not included in this video. Um, all right, uh, coming uh, to the last, um, uh, the last, um, just the last content from my side. Uh, I'll just play this video. Uh, this is about injury management and how important it is. All right, so just watch this really closely. All right. So, um, if you watch that video closely, it's unbelievable, right? Um, I don't know how many players in the circuit or how many players in the world would survive that kind of a uh, movement, but Djokovic did, and um, it just pays dividend as to you know what his uh, physical capabilities are and how much he's worked to reach that level, right? Um, most players 
to be honest, will not even attempt that because they wouldn't reach the ball. Um, but the fact that he attempted it, if you see his ankle, right, both, both of the ankles are rolling, his knees have, um, like, it's almost a full split. Um, you know, he shifted his body weight from the center towards the right to play the shot and then he's recovered from that. To be honest, even if someone tried it, uh, I don't even know how many injuries would happen um, at that point of time. So, um, in terms of, in, uh, again, that's the importance of flexibility and eccentric strength. Now, if he didn't have the strength, eccentric strength, he wouldn't be able to return that ball. Just flexibility wouldn't help, right? So, fitness is um, something that you have to use as a whole. You can't just train, say, for example, you just can't train one energy system. You can't just train strength. You can't just train one form of strength, right? Um, you can't just train hypertrophy. You, ju- you, have to, you have to train uh, power. You have to train reactive strength. You have to train maximal strength, right? So there are different forms of strength that you have to train. And that's where I think a, f- a fitness coach comes in and says, okay, this is how we can monitor load. This is how much you should be ideally, should ideally be able to train, right? Um, so um, this is, I think, uh, where you know, the team can really work together in an academy situation. And um, now I'd like to just bring in a few things with regard to how I plan a season for a particular academy and in terms of, um, you know, how a physiotherapist is also involved. So um, the first things first is onboarding, uh, onboarding assessments. So this is when the player enters the academy. First thing I do is take a current state of fitness. So do a fitness test. Now there are a wide range of fitness tests, tests that you can do. Do a fitness test that you can repeat over a course of time to see improvement in the athlete. Do a fitness test which which allows you um, to do it based on your facility. Now, if you don't have the facilities, um, you have to make do with what you get, right? Just ensure that everything can be measured. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Fitness test, you start off, say, for example, um, you do a speed test. So a speed test could be a 20 meter flying test where from zero to five meters, I take a timing reading. And again, from zero to 20 or from five to 20 meters, I take a, a timing a, a reading. Uh, say, for example, I do a strength test. The strength test would be um, number of push-ups one can do for 60 seconds or a number of sit-ups one can do for 60 seconds for your core. Um, if it's an advanced level athlete, maybe, um, you know, three, three RM or a one RM. So your three rep max for a squat or, you know, a three rep max for a deadlift or a bench press. So these are things that I can keep, um, I can, um, f- when the athlete comes in on day one, on day 90, I can test him again and see as to how much he's improved, right? So um, similarly, you can have endurance test, maybe a 1.5 uh, mile endurance test. Again, that endurance test, how you run that 1.5 uh, mile is important. If you're running it on track, it's different. Your reading, your timing will be different. And if you're running on court, it will be very different, right? Also running on court, just... <laughs> To let everybody know it's it's pretty torturous for an athlete right to just run 1.5 uh, miles around or you know run 1500 kilo, um, kilo, kilometers around the court it is uh, daunting for the athlete to just you know around the small space to run that amount so try and come up with new tests that you can do right endurance all about aerobic uh, capacity so add aerobic capacity tests that you can test again and again and again right um, you can do a flexibility test a simple one sit and reach um, you can do a mobility test your range of motion for your shoulders um, there are plenty of tests. You can do a power test, maybe a vertical jump, maybe a broad jump, right? Um, in terms of physiotherapy, uh, the onboarding would be a musculoskeletal assessment. So a musculoskeletal assessment is for the physiotherapist to check the joints, the ligaments, um, the muscles of the particular athlete, any imbalances, any instability, pronated feet, um, you know, shoulders caving in, the spine not being neutral, uh, scoliosis or any sort of you know uh, injury that was there in the past uh, or any sort of um, you know alarming situation that the strength and conditioning coach needs um, for the rehab situation right and whatever we do obviously as I said earlier is to have the um, to have an expected outcome so the expected outcome of this particular case is setting a benchmark for each player and reducing injuries in the shoulder and lower body right um, next up, we go to the injury management. So under the injury management, now once I do the test, I know what the academy prevention plan is, injury prevention plan. So I'll know whether the athlete fits into that system, right? Then I'll know how to assess the fatigue and well-being of the athlete because I've tested him, right? Uh, I'll know as to what mobility and muscle activation he needs to be done. And then obviously give him suggestions as to how to uh, release and recovery. All right. Um, for the physio in terms of injury management, he'll have the injury individual history. He'll make the rehab plan, and he'll ensure that you know the the player will 
players should come back and report and say that okay, in terms of any injury, how to report an injury as simple as that, right? Uh, expected outcome here is making sure that the individual has a protocol to that uh, so that he follows that and improves for the next fitness test. Um, then you can come up with a conditioning plan based on what assessment was done. Um, you can come up with a pre-training plan and a post-training plan. So here I mentioned in a pre-training plan that reaction and footwork is something that I want to work on. Uh, specific strength is something that I'll work on. So it could be, as I said, maximal strength. It could be endurance. It could be, um, you know, contrast training uh, strength methods. Um, then proprioception is something that I'll want to train and muscle activation. Uh, from a physio's point of view, again, only if you have a physio full time, you'll do the checkup, release, and taping before um, you know the athlete gets onto the court. And um, the expected outcome out of this is making sure that you're prepared for the day. All right. So for a fitness coach, it's important to know as to what the tennis coaches are doing on court as well. So just to have a broad uh, idea of you know where they're starting. If they're starting with serves, can we do something to prep them up for the serves so that they can go all out there and improve that percentage of their serves or improve the performance of their serves? Post training, um, these are things that I normally do: core stability and hypertrophy, and uh, obviously improve the range of motion. Um, for them, from the physio's aspect, it would be more of uh, working on the range of motion and your release. Um, so here I mentioned as the expected outcome is harder sessions need to be equal, uh, is equal to smarter planning. Uh, and then you obviously notice, you know, uh, note even the session duration. So this is just a broad aspect of what my injury management plan would be for the academy or for an individual player when they come to me. So I have, uh, you know, um, everything is noted down. Everything has to be documented because only then you can review it. Right. And only then you'll know the progress of the player. So if he's getting injured, you'll know as to why he's getting injured, because it could be his past history. It could be something that I neglected from my end or the player would have neglected from his end. Or maybe the physio has not properly done it right. Again, there's no 100 percent solutions, but at least over here with this planning, we are working towards getting a higher percentage of um, injury prevention, which is ideal for sport. Uh, with this, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I don't have time, I would have taken you through the eight stage model of, of evaluating a tennis serve. I'm sure most of you would have gone through it. Um, not more, um, I don't want to touch upon the technical aspect of it because um, you have obviously coaches to do that, but um, maybe you can just copy this uh, link below and uh, you can go through it because I can't send it through Zoom, the link, there's no hyperlink option. So you can copy this link and go through it just from a fitness point of view as to what are the different phases because um, as, a, as a tennis player, athlete serves the most. So uh, most of the injuries are also uh, caused because of the serve. So, um, you know, what the athlete needs to work in terms of range of, uh, range of motion and stability. So that's something that will be useful. Thank you. Uh, we can open it up for any questions or if the panelists have anything else. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chelston. I think uh, you touched, uh, covered uh, the fundamental uh, concepts of training uh, really well which is uh, most useful for coaches because this information is what uh, coaches need when they work with uh, athletes. A um, few questions. Uh, uh, can you switch on your video, Bali? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, uh, I mean, we, we just start on questions. I mean, a lot of questions, but I think we can't cover everything. I'll just uh, yeah. ask a few. Uh, a lot sure. of questions were asked on uh, how to train under 10 kids. I think uh, you can okay. uh, speak about uh, that aspect. Okay, so uh, when it's under 10 kids, again, you see um, the which phase of training they are in, right? So that is more the fundamentals. So what I would do is in terms of fitness, not really have instructions as such, but have more game-oriented um, exercises. So uh, game-oriented drills where they're working on jumping, where they're working on landing, where they're working on um, sprints, right? So the most important motor skills that you have to learn is one is how, how to land first. Second is how to run, how to sprint, how to stride, how to bound and how to change direction. So these six, six aspects, once you learn it, um, I think it's uh, easier for you to uh, plan their tennis session on court and it's also easier for them to move up to the next level. And uh, Chelston, uh, one more uh, aspect uh, I think you didn't have time to speak about is uh, training girls, especially girls yeah. uh, you know, who are you know, uh, going through their uh, menstruation and things like that. Yeah, so I'll just touch upon that. Um, as I said earlier as well, um, see up to the age of 10, you can treat the boys and girls almost the same because the energy levels are the same. In fact, 
at most times you'll see the balance and coordination plus stability better in girls up to the age of 10. Now, when you move to 10 to 14, um, more or less, again, they are the same. But between the age of, I would say, 12 to 16 is when, um, you know, uh, the girls would reach a stage where their fat percentage will naturally increase. Now, when the fat percentage increases, we got to be more skeptical on what they are doing. Right. We cannot make them perform the same drills that the boys are performing. One, because the boys are growing faster, they're maturing faster, their muscles are growing faster and the load that they can take is much more than the girls can take. Right. There might be obviously the exceptional one, two or three girls, obviously at the professional level as well. Um, um, there are um, girls playing at 16, 17 at a very high level, but those are exceptions. All right. So mostly. Um, it will, you will find the case where the girl is, you know, um, because of that excess weight or the excess fat percentage that they're putting on, we need to be a little more, we need to scale them back and make sure that, you know, the strength training, uh, strength training is taken care of. So in that aspect where, uh, for example, I would concentrate more on the lower body because they again need to learn how to land, right? The, as I explained as in the fundamentals, the landing stage. Now the landing stage will change because there's too much load on your muscle. There's too much load on your knees, on your ligaments, right? So first, I would say strength training. Second is your mobility, stability. The balance and coordination, they will anyway have. So um, just training the strength aspects and being more skeptical about that, being more careful about that, right? Uh, once you see them improve on that aspect, then you put them onto power and plyometrics and then you treat them like the same, you treat them, uh, you train them like the energy system that like you train the boys. But the important aspect is to identify when they actually require more strength training as compared to, um, um, you know, speed and agility or endurance training. Okay. And uh, to be very uh, like the specific thing is the day when uh, the girls have periods. I mean, uh, if you're, when you're training them. Yeah. So... So, okay, so uh, um, this is another very important question and very, um, I think for all coaches to know that, um, see, everyone is different, all right? What uh, one person is experience, uh, experiencing, it need not be the same with the other person. So now as per research from top level female athletes, um, what they have to say about this process is as they grow, okay, as they get more accustomed to, um, you know, the, the menstruation cycle, they tend to not take rest on the days of the period. Um, or for example, a lot of athletes, because of the stress and tension, uh, get, that, get, get their period during uh, competition and they go about their business just like a normal day. Now, why they do that is one, is they're not, um, just because the body is saying no, the mind shouldn't, uh, ideally, you know, shouldn't give up, all right? And secondly is, uh, once you do it over a period of time, they get used to it. So whether or not, um, you know, they're, uh, what cycle they're going through, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, they've trained uh, under all these circumstances and, um, you know, high performance will take place. Um, a lot of uh, athletes the, at the senior level have won championship, have won medals, have won matches on this cycle. Um, so at a developing stage, yes, make sure that, you know, the, um, so initially just let them take a break. All right. I would say give them a break, get them, let them get used to it. And over a period of time, when the athlete is performing well on the on the court, and you know you don't want the um, you don't want the stress levels to go higher and things like that, you bring down the intensity, but they can continue training as far as um, you know they are comfortable with it. Okay. Now uh, uh, another question, which uh, you know it's about uh, how important you feel as uh, uh, a strength and conditioning coach working with uh, like we are talking about tennis here how, how important is it that you know there's a good uh, communication between the tennis coach and the, the the fitness coach how much information they should share and what kind of information should be uh, shared yeah um, i think um, as rohan mentioned even though tennis is an individual sport at the end of the day it is a team sport as well because um, a player cannot perform individually uh, without coaches, without a backup system, right? So this is where the communication between coaches is very, very important. Now, um, I say this with um, with a lot of, um, um, you know, with, with some amount of experience coming back, uh, because when I first entered the tennis court, um, I had never played tennis in my life. Um, till today, I have not really, um, you know, mastered the game. Uh, to any, um, you know, to any level. But what I understand is just being on court, 
gives me um, you know i might know all the strength and conditioning of sports science behind but if you're not on court you really don't know what's happening in a player's uh, in a um, in a player's life or in a in a training session um so one thing is communication i think a lot i uh, there was a lot for me to learn when um, you palusa was uh, you know had come into uh, taken a few had come into rbta to take uh, sessions because the communication that you pass on to me is very very important right just like in an injury management perspective when a physio says that okay there is um, um, the alignment here is wrong or you know this is he has pronated feet and you need to work on this this and this 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 and this so then i work on that rehab protocol same way the feedback from the uh, from the tennis coach is very important for me to know as to what to work on right so uh, there's one i i like to give this example about uh, about one of the players who recently played in uh, um, the challenger that happened in bangalore so um, i think um, there was one feedback from uh, the head coach was uh, this player needs to be a little lower right uh, when he's lower he's producing greater force and he's winning more points he's hitting more winners so me as an snc coach this was the feedback that i could give the head coach saying that um, you know his strength endurance is not good but his power is really good so what i need to work on now because of that feedback given by the head coach is to work on that strength endurance so that he stays low there's no injury that happens because what happens when the player is forced to stay low and you know he doesn't have the strength that will lead to injury right so that's why he's not staying low um, but because of this feedback i'll make him stay low over a period of time only after uh, you know his body is adapted to it so that's important feedback given from the uh, from the head coach to the fitness coach so it is very very important thank you uh, chelston thanks for your time and uh, sharing your knowledge i'm i have thank no you, doubt that you know this information you have passed on is so so important and valuable so many coaches who uh, you know who wanted to know about fitness and uh, how to train i mean if you see the question and answer section yeah, here yeah. the number of questions come in but obviously we can't take all the questions and answer one by one but uh, guys i mean listening in if you want to meet chelston please make a trip to bangalore <laughs> you can talk to him in person and uh, he'll give you all the time uh, you need so with that uh, i think uh, you know i mean uh, appreciate your effort and an excellent uh, presentation you, chelston and uh, all the best you, to you, you. in uh, all your uh, you know, the all the work you are doing with your uh, athletes thank you thanks and uh, again thanks for the opportunity and i'm really happy to be involved uh, with tennis and um, hopefully in the future uh, you know uh, i'll try and play a major role in um, you know the whole process of having the athletes from a competitive uh, from from a from a growing stage to reach the competitive competitive stage so thank you for the opportunity and uh, great work having the uh, having this webinar thank you all thank you all for listening thank you suresh show to you suresh yeah, thanks a lot chelston wonderful presentation a lot of good words in the in the chats i can see they loved it thank you very useful uh, balu before you go out can you come back balu I know we have to wind up, but I have a couple of questions to ask you because uh, about your communication. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you is, you were talking about uh, uh, working. I mean, coaching during the match. Yeah. Yeah. You were giving some instances, which is very very yeah. interesting to listen to. Uh, can you throw some light on what you would do during the match, like you, if you are allowed to teach? What, what is it that do? I would be talking about during the match? Yeah, yeah. Can you throw throw some light on what you can do, what where your limits are, and things like that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I can give with example, like you know, so, uh, like you know, player starts the match and uh, you know he's uh, kind of uh, not settling in and he's uh, going all over. When during the changeover, we can you know kind of uh, calm him down or give him the assurance that the match has just started. I mean, the opponent isn't playing uh, unbelievable, and uh, you know you haven't uh, been at your best, and still the games have been close. So just you know, hang in there and settle down. Okay. So that reassurance uh, helps them uh, yeah. calm down. I mean that is one example. The other one is uh, like you know the direct uh, tactical thing. Like you know if you notice the opponent is uh, you know serving uh, more to your backhand and uh, you know he's winning points, you just uh, point it out that uh, keep an eye on it. He's uh, Serving more uh, to your backhand, and uh, this is what is happening. So it's a uh, it's a tactical uh, thing, but um, mostly I feel uh, where it helps is in the the emotional uh, part where they suddenly look to you know think of something and 
you bring them on track uh, from outside. So, I mean, for uh, like the match, I was sitting with Prajnesh out of like uh, three sets, uh, maybe twice I will uh, speak to him. Okay. <laughs> so, not like I talked to him. So, twice and then, okay, after that, uh, we are only reminding him of that uh, from outside because you are allowed to speak from okay. the same side. So, you can remind him. Yeah. And it also depends on player. Like some players uh, would like to you know, uh, get uh, keep looking at you for reassurance more. Yeah. Uh, some players are okay. I mean, they get the hang of it and they are on their own. Yeah. Only then, if they need something, they again uh, look at you or ask you. Yeah. Again, go. So you okay. should have to know the player first. Then it's easier, uh, much easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, I also wanted to ask you one more thing, but I don't think we have time. Okay. I'll just mention the question. And the next time you come in uh, as a panelist, then you can probably answer. Uh, in the communication with parents, yeah. I think this is something all the coaches need it. I think you can actually take a five or ten minute you know, uh, presentation on that, on how to deal with parents, how to deal with difficult parents, and what are the expectations and things like that. So yeah. we'll try to do this. Balu, can you do it uh, in one of these days if you have a little time? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Not, yeah. So we'll add it. So you you know how I speak, so <laughs> <laughs> I know why you're asking this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, uh, <laughs> no, I'm sure you learned. You were you were in a certain way initially, and then you you have come a long way. You know? So I'm <laughs> yeah. sure you have a yeah, lot no, of things to share. And then knows how everybody can, can learn. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, about tomorrow's session, we're going to start at 10 as usual, but there is a change. We're going to have a different presenter. It was scheduled uh, for me to present tomorrow on goal setting, but it is going to be John B talking about the psychological. John Key. John Key, sorry. John Key talking about the psychological aspects of uh, tennis. And it's going to be a very useful session. She's an expert from uh, Mumbai. And uh, she seems to be well, well known in the tennis circle. She's been working with some good players as well. I'm sure she has a lot of things to tell us. Balu, is there anything you want to add about Janki for tomorrow's session? Uh, the Janki was a former uh, tennis player herself, and uh, oh, okay. So and also she has been working with uh, like the Indian hockey team and uh, oh, a lot wonderful. of uh, okay. athletes who are at the Olympic and international level. Oh, so I'm sure we have uh, an interesting session coming up and. Uh, Okay. She will touch upon uh, yeah. the tennis related aspect. She can relate to it because she has played. Yeah. There, there were a lot of questions about how to work on the mental aspect, how to work on the mental mm, aspect. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. So it'll be, it's going to be a very useful session for everyone. And yeah. tomorrow again, we will uh, be having a, a celebrity <laughs> to make, to start off things and then, you know, then we'll go right into the session. So thank you all for being here and thank you, Balu, for a wonderful uh, you know, session. And for Chelsea and Pinto, it was really, really, you know, throwing light on a lot of different aspects. I had my trainer watching it and he had very good words about the session. So he mentioned that uh, he's not seen a presentation like this specific for tennis. And Chelsea had made it very specific for tennis, which is like hacks off. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And we'll have this presentation on the YouTube. Bye and uh, have a wonderful day. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye, guys. Uh, stay Bye, safe. Everyone. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Take care and stay safe.